right, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on the National Interest Waiver. Uh, this really is a special green card option, um, in particular because it actually allows entrepreneurs and uh, those who are self-employed to pursue a green card. So um, it has become an especially popular option, um, in particular for our clients. Um, so we're very fortunate today to have our associate, uh, senior associate, G.A. Huang, uh, who has extensive experience preparing national interest waivers uh, here to speak to us. Um, my name is Dustin Saldariaga. I will be me moderating uh, the presentation. Um, please go ahead and send in any questions you might have. I will be monitoring the questions actively. So you can send those in by using either our chat function or our Q&A function on Zoom. Um, I may share those with GA during the presentation or at a minimum I'll, um, I'll save them for the end, but either way we do expect that we'll get through all of the questions by the end of the webinar. Real quick, just as background, this is part of a series. We try to do at least two webinars a month, and we do those on a variety of immigration topics. Although our firm does focus on business immigration, we really do handle the full spectrum of immigration cases, whether that's family immigration, humanitarian, um, and everything in between. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if we can be helpful at all. Um, we will, after this presentation, be sharing a guide on the National Interest Waiver. We'll also share the PowerPoint that you see on your screen, and we'll send a link where you can sign up for the webinar, future webinars uh, that I mentioned. And finally, the email will have a link to our YouTube channel. And we try to share a lot of high quality information through our YouTube channel, again, running the full spectrum of immigration issues. So, um, and those videos do include the full length uh, webinars. This webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it to YouTube. So check out our channel. We hope that it's helpful uh, to you. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it off to GA. Yeah, thank you so much, Dustin, for the introduction. Yeah, so let's jump right into it. So I'll start by explaining a little bit what is the NIW. So as you may already be familiar, NIW is short for National Interest Waiver, and it is a subset of the EB2 employment-based green card immigrant petition category, right? So immigrant petition means this is an application for a green card, the right to permanently reside in the United States, permanent resident status. A green card gives someone the, so someone the ability to live in the U.S. and work for any employer or work for no employer at all. Having a green card also opens up the pathway to U.S. citizenship in the future, so it is a very, very valuable thing for a lot of people. The EB2 NIW is a popular choice among individuals who want to apply for a U.S. green card on their own, and that means self-petitioning, and that just means you apply as an individual, uh, whereas normally you would need a U.S. employer to sponsor you um, in traditional employer-based categories for, for the green card. Now, EB1A, Extraordinary Ability uh, Green Card, is another category where you are allowed to self-petition. Um, but EB2 NAW is valuable because it can be a viable option for a wide variety of professionals who can show that their work will make significant contributions to the industry or society or economy as a whole. Okay, so let's look at what is then the eligibility criteria for an NIW. So first, um, you do need to meet the EB2 threshold category, um, which is a category open for advanced degree professionals, right? So what does this mean? So advanced degree is defined as a master's degree or an above, and it includes JD, MD, MBA, for example, for which you do need a bachelor's degree to qualify um, to apply for those uh, advanced degrees. Now, if you have a bachelor's degree in your field and after you receive your bachelor's, you have five or more years of progressive work experience in your field following your bachelor's degree. Uh, and by progressive, I, I mean work experience with increasingly senior duties and um, responsibilities where your titles and salaries uh, generally change upwards, then you could also be considered uh, as having the equivalent of a master's degree in your field. So. And, and to prove this, you would want to get employer confirmation letters from your previous employers uh, on letterhead and signed by the appropriate official um, 
confirming that you have worked for that required period of time and that your duties have changed um, to generally to more senior duties as time went on. Now, if you don't have an advanced degree and if you don't have a bachelor's degree and five or more, more years of work experience, there is an alternative way you can meet the EB2 threshold, and that is by um, showing that you have exceptional ability. And so how do you show exceptional ability? So the first um, the first thing that you do need to show is that you meet three out of seven criteria, at least three out of seven criteria, uh, which includes 10 years of full-time experience, uh, a related degree, any degree, doesn't have to be a bachelor's, it can be an associate's diploma, for example, uh, related to your field of proposed endeavor, um, if you if your work if your field of work requires a license, you can show that you possess that license. You can also show that you have membership in professional associations in your field. Uh, you can also show that you have received recognition in the field for significant and original contributions made to your field, such as awards, patents, papers published, um, and and any anything else. That could that could count as um, contributions to your field. You could also show that you command a higher salary than most average professionals in your field, which can show um, that you have exceptional ability. Accumulatively, the evidence should show that you do have a degree of expertise that is significantly above that ordinarily encountered in the sciences, arts, or business. So there is a bit of a qualitative assessment there as well. Now, let's say once you have met the threshold criteria for the EB2, the next step is to prove that you meet um, you you meet the qualifications for a national interest waiver, which is which which means that the government will exempt the ordinary labor certification requirement for you because um, your work meets the three prongs set out by a case called Matter of Denisar um, for a national interest waiver um, for that category. So let's look at what these three criteria are. So the first criteria is that your work in the United States, um, which is called your proposed endeavor, uh, needs to have substantial merit and national importance. And what does this mean? So a substantial merit of a proposed endeavor can be demonstrated in a variety of fields, um, including the arts, sciences, business, and even culture. Um, and for national importance, what the government is looking for is that does your work not only benefit your immediate clients or your immediate employer, but does your work have national or global implications within a particular field, for example, by introducing advances to how things are usually done, um, for example, medical advances or improve manufacturing processes uh, that can really have um, significant spillover effects, positive spillover effects to the economy. Now, the second criteria is that you are well positioned to advance the endeavor. And for that, the focus is on the individual and the individual's education, record of success, uh, work experience, and other uh, types of their own skills and their own knowledge and know-how that could really um, position them well to, to um, advance the project that they, that they propose to do. So as I mentioned before, um, relevant degrees, that's certainly important. Relevant experience, work experience, that's important. Um, really what the government is looking for is can you show a record of success in the relevant field where you, you are proposing to work at? All right, so the third criteria then um, is that on balance, it should be beneficial to the United States to waive the labor certification requirement for that particular petitioner. Now, to meet that criteria, usually uh, you can do it in a variety of ways. You can show that the benefits of your proposed work is broad enough to outweigh the ordinary benefits of the labor certification process, um, which which is to protect one job spot for a U.S. worker. You can show that the potential positive benefits to the economy that your work can have is much larger than that. Uh, and one thing to note here is that in order to get to the third prong, you do need to first meet prong one and prong two as well. So you, you do need to meet all three prongs in order to qualify for the NIW. All right, so moving on to how can the national interest waiver use be used for entrepreneurs in particular? So it is very interesting uh, because the previous case law uh, which, which is called um, New York State Department of Transportation, 
really focus on the national scope of the endeavor, whereas matter of Danazar, which is the case law that replaced New York State Department of Transportation, is now focuses on national importance of the endeavor. Now, it, it, it can seem that those two um, are very similar in languages, but it, it's actually quite di different because uh, now with the new standard, even endeavors that are focused on one geographic area can now be found to have national importance. For example, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you set up a factory um, in, in, let's say in Virginia, and you are locally producing and distributing an innovative product, an innovative architectural product that can reduce waste and make buildings more energy efficient. Let's say you are an entrepreneur doing that. Now, with the previous criteria, if your work was only being produced and used in Virginia, uh, there is an argument that the government can make that the work is not national in scope. However, uh, with the new standard, even if your work is, even if all of the work is being done in Virginia, in, in Virginian facilities, the endeavor can still have national importance as long as you can show that it can spark progress in the industry and that it can significantly advance governmental priorities such as promoting energy sustainability in buildings. So as long as you can pr promote, prove national importance, it doesn't matter that physically your endeavor is limited in a particular region. So that's one advantage now uh, that entrepreneurs have when um, considering the NIW. Um, the second advantage that an entrepreneurs have um, is that case law specifically recognizes that a green car through NIW could be a good solution for entrepreneurs who cannot go through the ordinary labor certification process. And the reason why is because many entrepreneurs have an ownership interest in their company, right? So often it is not possible for them to use the traditional employer sponsorship route for uh, employment-based green card uh, because of their ownership. And second, it is also a, con a consideration now that entrepreneurs actually do create more jobs through, through you know, uh, developing their business and, and we can argue that Congress's interest in protecting the U.S. labor supply and Congress's interest in making jobs available for U.S. workers can actually be better served by exempting the entrepreneur from going through the labor certification process um, because the entrepreneur will go on then to create more jobs for U.S. people, for U.S. employers, employees. Now, the third point where entrepreneurs could have an advantage in um, exploring the NIW as an option is that the case law specifically recognizes that an entrepreneur doesn't need to prove that a business will ultimately succeed, right? So the case law recognizes that many entrepreneurial projects may ultimately fail. Instead, the standard is whether the applicant presents a plausible plan with prospective impacts that can rise to the level of national importance and whether the applicant is well positioned to advance the endeavor. So it doesn't matter um, that 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 um, the applicant is not required to prove how likely their, their venture will succeed as long as they present a plausible plan. All right, we can move on to the next slide. All right, so timing and other considerations when moving from a non-immigrant visa to the NIW. So it is important to go over here that a green card application has two steps. So the first step is the underlying petition. In this case, what is called the I-140, which is the stage that determines whether you're eligible for a green card under that category. And the second step is the actual application for a green card. So the timing for the I-140, which is the first step, an action, which could be the decision, an RFE, or an NOID, can be rendered within 45 days if you use premium processing. Now, if you use regular processing, uh, usually the I-140 itself can be pending for around a year. That is the average that we've been seeing. Once you have the approval, you can, uh, you can apply for a green card based on this, and, and this part can also take a year after that, but um, in order for you to be able to move on to the green card process, you need to make sure that the priority dates for your category is current. And, and we will get a little bit uh, further in detail about the issue of priority dates. 
So now let's talk a little bit, bit about the underlying visa status. So it is important to recognize that the NIW application is an applicant is an application for an immigrant visa, is an application for a green card that in itself is an expression of immigrant intent. So if you are on a status or if you have a non-immigrant visa already that is not dual intent, uh, for example, the TN visa, uh, it may be difficult to renew that visa or status once you have filed the I-140 application because those categories are strictly assessed for immigrant intent. So the timing is important when you're considering applying for an NIW. It could be a safer choice to renew your TN first, for example, then apply for the I-140. Then what does the application process look like? So as I mentioned a, a little bit beforehand, the first step of applying for the green card is the I-140 peti uh, I petition. Um, you can use um, premium processing to get a response within 45 days, um, and you would collect the proof that you meet the eligibility requirements and um, submit, it in, submit it to USCIS. Now, the second step is the I-485 or consular processing. And what does that mean? The I-485 uh, is what is called the adjustment of status application. If you are already in the United States on a different status, you can apply to adjust status to a green card holder from within the United States. However, in order to be able to file the I-485, the, uh, there must be immigrant visas available in that category and your priority date uh, for your category must be current. Uh, consular processing uh, means you are instead working with your home country consulate to apply for an immigrant visa. So you would attend the interview at the home country consulate and get a physical visa stamp in your passport and you will enter the United States again um, as a landed immigrant. And the timing for either the I-485 or consular processing can also take many months, around a year, and it really depends on the workload um, of, of that particular uh, time period. Now, is the category current? So I, I've already alluded to this uh, in, in the matter of priority dates, but this has actually become an issue uh, quite recently since the end of 2022. Um, every year, so there is a limit of the number of green cards that can be issued under each category. And except for certain countries, for the EB2 NIW, the priority dates have already always been current, which means there is no backlog at all. So you can go ahead and uh, either concurrently file the I-485 if you're already in the United States, or uh, as soon as you're approved, you could go ahead and um, apply for an immigrant visa at your home country consulate. Uh, however, um, since the end of 2022, that has no longer been the case for all countries. So this means more, there are more applicants in that visa category than there are immigrant visas available. Um, so there is a waiting period for all applicants right now. Um, for example, the, the July 2023 bulletin shows that only an applicant who filed their application earlier than February 2022 can move forward for a green card. So let's say if you've filed for the I-140 for the NIW category uh, at the beginning of this year in January 2023, and let's say you've used premium processing and you got the approval in, in um February or March 2023, you have to wait until the priority date progresses such that it is the, the date that is shown in the visa bull bulletin is um, later than the date you filed your application, which would be January 2023. You have to wait until that happens before you can either file the I-485 or, um, or engage in the consular uh, processing um, immigrant visa application. Uh, so each year in October, a new batch of visas become available. So uh, it is likely that there will be some movement um, within a couple months, uh, but this basically means that even after your I-140 is approved, an applicant may need to wait for many months until they can actually move forward to get their green card. Uh, so uh, actually uh, there is one topic that I forgot to mention. Yeah, so pros and cons of adjusting status in the United States versus consular processing. So that is also very important um, 
consideration to think about. So as I mentioned before, the I-485 adjusting status is a process where applicants can continue living in the United States in the interim while their I-485 green card application is processing. And if you are living outside of the United States, this is not an option for you. You can only apply uh, for the I-485 if you're already in the United States uh, on a different status, such as the H-1B or E-2, for example. And simply filing the I-140 and IW application does not provide the applicant uh, any basis to continue remaining in the United States after their underlying statuses have expired. So only after you have filed the I-485 application, your, your status is effectively uh, extended, which means you, your authorized stay um, is extended. Um, and once you file the I-485, it is important to know that you cannot travel outside of the U.S. without abandoning the application unless you apply for and receive an advanced parole document, which is a travel authorization document that uh, allows you to travel in and out of the U.S. while the I-485 is pending. And this can also take up to a year to get. So, so um, if you're planning on applying for the I-485, it is very important to know uh, to plan ahead and make sure that you don't need to travel internationally um, during that interim time when you don't have your travel authorization. By contrast, if you choose consular processing, it allows you to travel back and forth in and out of the U.S. and maintain your underlying non-immigrant status. And it could be advantageous if you need to preserve the ability to travel frequently to your home country until your green card process is complete. And um, it is also important to note here that family members can apply along with the main applicant, uh, including the spouse, dependent children under 21 years and unmarried. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit the updated guidelines for STEM applicants and entrepreneurs that came down uh, in the beginning of 2022. Um, so for STEM, one thing to note is that the government has published a list of critical and emerging technologies called the CNET. And if your endeavor, proposed endeavor, is related to one of these areas that the government has listed as important to national security and interest, uh, it could be favorable for your application. And so these CNET technologies include the following, and I'll just read off from my list, advanced computing, advanced engineering materials, advanced manufacturing, sensing technologies, aero engine technologies, agricultural technologies, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, biotech, communications and networking technologies such as 5G networks, data science and data storage technologies, distributed ledger technologies, energy technologies, medical and public health related technologies, quantum science, semiconductors, and space technologies. And, and you can, you can, look to government reports that uh, talk about why these um, uh, technologies are important to the United States. And it is very favorable if um, you can point to one of those and talk about how your proposed endeavor relates to advancing US technical competence in those areas. Um, STEM advanced degree holders, if you have a PhD um, that is in STEM, which is you know science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, that could be advantageous to showing that you are well positioned to advance your endeavor. Um, however, just by having a degree in STEM is not enough to meet that criteria. And you do need to show uh, some traction that your previous work has had uh, in the form of uh, a record of success in a relative and unrelated field of research, um, such as a publication record uh, or things like that. Entrepreneur specific guidelines. So, so in the 2022 updates, we also saw uh, quite uh, some more detail added on what kinds of special types of evidence entrepreneurs can um, submit to support their application. And this includes uh, specific forms of evidence such as um, letters from investors, um, venture capitalists, um, letters from um, 
letters that confirm awards or grants, uh, such as incubator admission and accelerator admission, those things that are particular to you know, business can now be used to support an NIW application. Uh, if you already have a business that you have been running in the United States for a long time, and if you can show uh, tax returns, for example, that show that you've been earning revenue, significant revenue through your company, if you can show uh, W-2 records that show you have already hired many U.S. workers through your company uh, that can support job creation and um, support job creation potential for your future work. So there are um, a variety of evidences that the government will now consider um, in support of an uh, entrepreneur's NIW petition. And with regards to well positioned, now if you have ownership and you, if you have a critical role in a U.S. entity, such as, you know, uh, your role being a CEO of your own company, that can now support that you are well positioned to um, advance your endeavor. Um, if you have, uh, even if you are not listed in a patent, if your company owns a patent. Um, regarding a technology that you're commercializing, you can also use that in support of your application, uh, media attention, um, letters from other th relevant third parties can also support that you are well positioned to uh, advance the endeavor. So now there is a, a large body of evidence you can pull from to creatively build, uh, build up your case. All right, so now let's discuss uh, how an NIW submission is structured and talk a little bit about the types of evidence that we typically include. So one important aspect of compiling the petition is compiling proof that you meet one of the threshold requirements uh, through either showing that you have an advanced degree or the equivalent of an advanced degree through having a bachelor's degree and over five years of progressive work experience um, or evidence that you uh, have exceptional ability in your field uh, by showing that you meet three out of the seven criteria, which shows that you are operating at a level significantly above what is ordinarily encountered in the field. Now, um, when you're trying to meet the advanced degree threshold through um, a bachelor's degree and five or more years of progressive work experience, it is very important to get um, employer confirmation letters from your previous employers that go into sufficient detail about what your duties were, how long were you working, was it full-time work, um, and how did your duties change uh, over time to, to prove that the, the progression was um, progressive. Now, the bulk of the petition will really be dedicated to presenting evidence of how and why you qualify for the national interest waiver, right? And that will really be uh, presenting evidence that you meet all three prongs. So the first prong, national importance and substantial merit of your proposed endeavor. You can, um, you should include a detailed statement of your proposed endeavor, talking about what you're uh, proposing to do in the United States, go into detail about the specific projects that you intend to pursue, what kind of traction your project has had to date, things like that. Um, to support the national importance of your project and how your project can have that requisite impact to the industry, the field, or society as a whole, um, you can um, you can obtain letters from relevant industry experts or government agencies covering your area. You can also supplement that with news articles, uh, reports from industry. Um, industry researchers, uh, market research, relevant data. Um, you can also rely on government's own pronouncements. So for example, if, if, your, if your proposed endeavor is related to environmental sustainability, you can pull um, reports from the EPA or other uh, relevant agencies that talk about why uh, the particular um, area that you're working in is important for the government. Um, executive orders is also uh, a good source to to uh, rely on to argue that a particular area is of top priority from the government. Um, a comprehensive business plan uh, is also recommended if your endeavor is an entrepreneurial endeavor to support that your 
proposed endeavor will have significant economic impact and uh, significant job creation potential. Uh, you can include a business plan describing the offerings that you are uh, developing and the magnitude of revenue generation potential you can expect. Um, expert letters. Expert letters are a very important part of an NIW, and really because the NIW is so dependent on the narrative of what you're trying to do and how it impacts matters of national importance, the expert letters really can be used to fill the gap um, and really interpret the data for the government officers to, to make a persuasive case um, to, to present your the importance of your endeavor. So what should be in the expert letters? Usually the expert letters will first contain an explanation of the expert's own credentials. Um, so we would typically include CVs, um, curriculum vitae's of professors or other senior um, actors in the industry uh, who have a long list of uh, impressive credentials, um, senior officers in top tier companies or venture capital funds or incubators with many decades of experience uh, analyzing companies similar to yours. So, so describing those credentials really uh, make it such that the opinions of these experts are reliable enough uh, for USCIS. And another important aspect that the expert letter should address is concrete examples with the most impactful projects that you have led in the past that impacted your field in some way. So those letters would support that you are well positioned to advance your proposed endeavor. And it is very important to build a narrative of what you have done in the past, how did you do things differently from what is ordinarily done, and what industry traction resulted from your endeavors. So let's say you developed a um, particular model for um, solar panels, and let's say the result of that technology was that the solar panels were able to generate 20% more uh, energy than the prevailing product of that era. And then as a result, what happened? Either your, your work resulted in the publication of a patent, let's say, uh, relating to that technology, or if you were able to commercialize that technology and you delivered those solar panels to I don't know, like like 10,000 clients. So those kinds of narratives is an example of what an expert letter can, can present, which can really uh, uh, make it understandable to a USCIS officer of what the impact of your work can be. So another um, aspect that the expert letters can focus on is why your work has national importance. Um, and really for those kinds of narratives, uh, the letters do need to have the right tone and detail. So we are looking for um, case studies that talk about impacts that go beyond benefiting just your previous employer or just your immediate clients or delivering great service. Uh, but you're really working to, to pull out details about what the contributions of your work can be to the industry or field as a whole. Um, and let's see, uh, other types of supporting documents we can include, um, proofs of professional accomplishments. So, so, and I alluded to, um, publication of patents earlier and to, to substantiate that you can also include copies of the actual patents, which show the technology and, um, provide corroborating evidence of the projects that the expert letters talk about. Uh, and it is very important to, to do so because if it is just the expert letters that talk about an achievement, the USCIS officers um, may not rely on those statements alone. So it is important to provide corroboration. And that can also be in the form of, you know, reports that you have authored, um, media, media evidence covering some of the achievements that you talk about. Um, and let's say you have pr presented about this work at you know, at a conference in the industry, uh, you may want to um, include the copies of programs and things like that that show that you that show that you actually participated in such conferences. So all of these records from your past work can uh, really be used to build a portfolio of uh, your record of success in your field. Uh, 
with regards to entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, another powerful form of evidence can be contracts with um, high profile clients that show that your work has seen practical um, practical application in the field and contracts can also show that there is uh, continuing demand for your work in, in the field of endeavor. So that can be uh, quite helpful. Letters of intent um, with clients or if you are working in partnership with governmental organizations, that can obviously be very helpful uh, since the NIW uh, is very interested in the public interest and um, the national interest in your uh, work. If you can show letters of intent, letters of support from government agencies that can really help your case. Um, proof of startup capital. So if you have um, a business idea and if you have raised third party uh, venture capital funding to support that idea, um, proof of such funding, such as uh, in the form of um, uh, share purchase agreements or um, agreements to invest or other types of promissory notes or other types of um, investment agreements. Uh, you can you can include copy of those to show that you your um, projects has seen such traction uh, among investors, and that could really help your petition as well. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about a case study. Um, of an entrepreneur who was able to successfully meet each of the three matter of Danisar criteria and was able to secure an NIW approval. So this case was for an entrepreneur who proposed to set up a small consulting firm focused on coordinating, coordinating projects with relevant organizations in um, veteran welfare for the purpose of improving the services given to veterans and the care provided to wounded warriors to facilitate their reintegration to productive society, right? So this person presented a very detailed business plan um, talking about how uh, this person would coordinate the organizations and projects, um, talking about specific uh, philanthropical and government agencies that he will work with. Um, the plan also was supported by letters from prospective clients, and um, these letters were able to verify how uh, this particular uh, consultant's support and advocacy will improve existing program offerings and talked about the um, urgent need for such improvements by identifying how, by identifying the ways that these programs lacked uh, in the U.S., um, in the United States at, at that time. And in support of this plan, this applicant also submitted government reports and uh, news articles and letters that um, describe, that specifically describe these gaps, existing gaps in veterans care and showing that there was sig significant public interest in improving services in this area. Then how did this person prove that he was well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor? So, so the, the main point was that this person already had a record of success in related endeavors in his home country. Um, and, and this person was able to present letters of support from very senior officials from government who had worked with him in the past. And Specifically, this person had already played a leading role in developing and implementing initiatives to connect uh, certain public and nonprofit organizations um, to other organizations to, to um, coordinate and put on um, specific programmings serving wounded warriors and veterans. Um, and this had focused specifically on veteran job placement reintegration into civilian life and expansion of critical services to these populations. And these letters uh, were describing significant detail on how uh, those improvements were made. And the petition also was able to identify what are the specific skills and know-how that only he had, and which, which is a know-how that would not be um, would not um, be able to be replaced with just another um, uh, professional in the United States. 
So for example, this person had a very high level of understanding and network connections to um, the US and uh, international charitable sectors that no other person could bring and the ability to bring this into concrete results and the scale of such as the scale of such uh, projects were large. So the um, expert letters uh, really described how tangibly the person's um, um, consulting projects enabled millions of dollars in charitable efforts to be productively connected with service organizations um, across the globe and change veterans' lives in this process. And that um, served as a compelling detail uh, that the government found to support that this person was indeed well positioned to advance the endeavor. Now then, on balance, uh, how did this person prove that it was beneficial to waive the labor certification requirement? So as a self-employed entrepreneur, um, this person was able to argue that it would be impractical to secure uh, a green card through the traditional means of employer, employer sponsorship. Um, and this person was also able to really hone in on the immense value in improving programs and assisting organizations that supported the welfare of U.S. veterans and wounded warriors, uh, which was proportionally much larger than the pro uh, countervailing governmental interest in saving one labor uh, spot for a U.S. worker, and uh, really the past record of success and proof of know-how that would not easily be replaceable by another worker in the United States. Um, it led the government to conclude that the U.S. would benefit from his contributions, even if other qualified U.S. workers were available uh, to perform these functions. All right. right. Well, GA, that was a lot of great information. Thank you. Um, we have not received any questions, so I will take the opportunity to thank you for sharing your expertise with everyone. Um, for those of you who are on the webinar, please do keep an eye out for our upcoming email um, where we'll list, we'll provide the link to sign up for future webinars as well as the presentation you see on your screen and a link to our YouTube channel where we will post this recording and where you can find a variety of other videos on all of the services our firm offers. So GA, thank you again. And to all of you on the webinar, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Dustin.